Good evening, and welcome to the BS and Beer Show. Of course, BS stands for Building Science. Tonight's topic is flashing details. Uh, I'm Travis Brungard. I'm in Prairie Village, Kansas. Tonight, I am drinking a Boulevard Brewing Company. Uh, this is actually a Rheingeist, so it's a collab. Um, sours and wonderful things with... Oh, excuse me. I said Rheingeist. It's a Crustfall. It's a collaboration with, with Rheingeist. It's like I can't get anything right, not even my beer. It's a good thing that we brought experts tonight. So BS and Beer is an independent grassroots movement, movement to share building science knowledge through local meetup groups and this, our Zoom show. The Brew Crew and our guests volunteer our time each week to bring you what we hope is a fun and informative discussion. Uh, just a brief moment to thank Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building Magazine, our media partners, and then I'll kick it off to Emily, who will tell us how this works. All right, hi guys. Uh, Emily Mosham, uh, I am back at it with the Omission IPA in my, or no, I'm sorry, this is a pale ale. Tried to find the IPA, apparently it's so popular it's sold out everywhere in my rock wool koozie. Uh, yes, thank you, Dan Edelman. Um, and Tonight, I am here to tell you what to do in the chat box. So um, we hope everybody introduces themselves. Tell us what you're drinking, even if it's just water in the chat box. Make sure that you pick everyone in the chat box so the people in the audience and the panelists can see your comments. That way we know you're here. Otherwise, the people in the audience can't see that you're here. So introduce yourself. Tell us you're here. Uh, have a lively chat uh, all night. Um, Vine Home Building sends out a Zoom reminder each week if you want to receive uh, information on what the show is going to be and not just a link reminder to show up for the show, uh, jump over to the bsandbeershow.com and join our mailing list where we send out a weekly update on who our guests are going to be and what the show is going to be about. Video recording uh, is available at Green Building Advisor and on our YouTube channel at the bsandbeershow.com after the show. So if you missed the show and you want to watch the replay or you missed any of our previous shows, all like 150 that we we did last year, however many that was, uh, are up on our YouTube channel. Um, there's also an audio only version of the BS and Pure show that's available on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you have to watch the show that way, it is available, although we think the video content is definitely the best way. And live means you get the chat and the video content. A uh, couple of announcements the Bi Midwest Building Science Symposium is coming up very shortly on September 28th and 29th. Um, so we're really excited about that at Boulevard Brewing in Kansas City. This year features presentations from our very own Ben Bogey and past guests and current guests tonight, Mike Gurton, Peter Yost, Randy Williams, Steve Basic, Jake Bruton. The event is free to attend, but you must register in advance at www.midwestbss.com. Uh, we also have a Keep Craft Alive meetup immediately after the day two presentations of the symposium in Kansas City, where it'll be a Keep Craft Alive uh, meetup happening in the same location uh, at Boulevard Brewing. This is open forum for professional discussion, as well as some surprise guests and a live fine home building podcast recording featuring hosts Patrick McComb and Rob Watzak. So uh, also worth noting, beer is free to all BS and beer enthusiasts in attendance, courtesy of Rockwool. So uh, if you didn't know about that, make sure that you pop over uh, and check that out. And now, Ben, if you want to introduce yourself and our guests. All right. So uh, I'm Ben Bogey this evening. I'm drinking a uh, Kent Falls Super Sparkle. It's an IPA brewed with Connecticut grains from my favorite brewery, Kent Falls. Um, this evening, uh, it's my pleasure and all of our pleasure to have a, a crew of phenomenal guests. Uh, we'll start off with Doug Horgan. Doug is the vice president of best practices at BOA, the Washington, D.C. area's premier custom and remodeling builder. In this training, in his Training, quality monitoring, and troubleshooting role, Doug's goal is to reduce Mike. Sorry, Mike's editing behind the scenes here as I'm trying to talk. No, no, it wasn't uh, me. Oh, somebody did. Uh, Doug's goal is to reduce construction defects through knowledge sharing. Doug's 30 years of experience in the field of carpentry, warranty, troubleshooting, and instructions, along with thousands of photos taken along the way, are the foundation for visually rich presentations on how to build well and avoid, avoid construction problems. Oh, Next, cool. Mr. Mike Gurton. Yeah, Doug, how are you doing? Sorry, I'm uh, I'm running right through here. Doug, what are you drinking this evening? 
Oh yeah, I forgot. Uh, well, water because I was in the attic for four hours today. But Devil's Alley IPA, if I'm feeling jolly later. Nice. Did I miss anything there in your intro that you? No, it's still too long. Anything? In fact, I thought yeah, I thought we had like a one sentence one, but it's all good. Doug, awesome guy, builds good stuff. There we go. Made made many 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 mistakes and tries to learn from them. Beautiful. All right. Next, Mr. Mike Gurton is a builder, writer, and educator based in Rhode Island. He has 40 years of experience tackling every facet of residential construction, from excavation and foundations to interior finish and tile setting. He shares his expertise regularly, writing articles and contributing to books, videos, and live events. His work has been featured in Fine Home Building, Journal of Light Construction, and Professional Deck Builder Magazines. Good evening, Mr. Gurton. How are you, sir? I'm well. How are you doing, Ben? I'm well. What's our uh, libation of choice this evening? Water from my well. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, next, we have Mr. Aaron Jones. He's a partner at Big Dog Construction on Grand Manan Island in New Brunswick, Canada. Aaron declared August 26, 2021 as the first annual National Flashing Awareness Day, which took social media by storm. Aaron is passionate about teaching the next generation of passive house. Of, oh, no. Oh, no sorry. Something happened uh, there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. Uh, next, uh, apprentices and, uh, and uh, sorry. I don't, know. I don't know why it's doing that. There Advanced we go. dachshund training. I mean, there's a number <laughs> of big dog responsibilities. You just list them off and it's fine. Yeah, yeah I got it, Ben. <laughs> there we go. Aaron is passionate about teaching the next generation of apprentices and considers himself a BS nerd in training. In his free time, Aaron enjoys shooting, I believe clay, clay, clay pigeons, pigeons was somewhere there. <laughs> yeah, somewhere there. Sorry about uh, that. Would we be BS? You're there, not uh, shooting puppies or or apprentices. <laughs> yeah, Aaron, how are you, sir? Pleasure to have you. What's your libation this evening? Uh, Big Ox Brewery, Black Currant Sour. So it's a local New Brunswick beer. <laughs> Travis is very happy. <laughs> Big flex for the uh, sours. Sours are becoming a thing. So. Now I'm just really happy to be here. Uh, it's truly an honor. Ben, your mesh network is falling apart. Excuse me? Your mesh network is closing in on you. You were briefly paused. I just wanted you to know, in case you were telling us the most important thing ever, you may have to Thank restate you. it. Blame it on Brian. Right. He's the new technical guy. All right, Brian, thanks for the technical difficulties here. I'm uh, trying to find your bio. Yeah, sorry, Ben. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Google Google Docs is not working. Yeah, if you Google go Docs, for everybody uh, behind the scenes, Google Docs is like editing our documents on its own while we're yeah, just doing them. Yeah, just jump down a few lines, Ben. Yeah, I got it. Brian Euler is part of the second <laughs> generation of Pioneer Builders, which builds custom high-performance homes in and around Port Orchard, Washington. He is a contributor and brand ambassador for Fine Home Building Magazine, and I'm sure I've seen you in JLC as well as other places, so neglected that. Brian, how are you this evening? Doing good, yeah. Not so much of a custom builder, it's just a spec builder now. So I've got builder a little bit of a different perspective. Yeah. Uh, spec is short for spectacular, choice. though, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, my last name is Euler, so spectacular. Never mind. That was a stretch, but it was a good one. My brother's <laughs> name is Musk, Musk Euler. I could do this all night. My dad's <laughs> name is Popular. <laughs> but I don't think that's what we're here oh, for. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. That's punny. <laughs> well, uh, so we're here to discuss uh, flashings this evening. And I think, uh, Doug, you may have something teed up to share with us. Unmute yourself. Thank you. I have pictures of just various kinds of flashings. If, they, if it comes up, I can, I can put up an illustration while we're discussing stuff. Um, I think uh, if we're looking for a good place to start, let's show Aaron's video. They really knocked my socks off. All right, Brian, that's you, I believe. Our new technical director, director Brian, muscular, popular, spectacular. <laughs> All right, I will be looking for the thumbs up. Make sure that you guys can hear this. I didn't uh, click to share sound, so maybe I need to do that. Multiple ways to do it. 
but because I require a full one inch up I'll stand on the end dam for the environment the, we're in, at the beginning of it, I'm... basically I make two marks, one inch and two inch. I'll try and get all the <clears throat> cuts in as we go here. We'll have to break it down. Very important, this inside cut here, don't cut past that one inch mark. Had some questions on how Roll to make the land dams. One. Multiple ways to do it, but because I require a okay. full one inch up stand. So basically, we've got this cut off here at the two inch. Got our line that we're going to put our fold on. Got this notched out here to the one inch point. Make sure your folding pliers are super tight. And there is a possibility that you're actually going to rip the metal instead of actually fold it. That's the first part of the fold there. It's so basically you're conducting some metal origami. So basically, next step, you want to flatten this out. Some fellas use a hammer. A lot of times I'll just use what I'm using for tools at the time. So right now, that's watertight. Got that all fold there. It's all folded. There's no holes. No seams. Last step. Next. Last final step. Put the folding pliers on one more time. And I fold that ear over. And it gives me a white end dam on both sides. On occasion, I will take snips and I will just clean that edge up just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. Still have your full one inch and that is a completed end dam. That is a thing of beauty. Is that the most often failed flashing that you guys all see? Because it is in my market. I never, very rarely see that done to that degree. I've never seen it done in the field. And I've only seen good in dams done on occasion in the field or in Mike Gurton demonstrations and fine home building articles. What I found is interesting, and Aaron, is that a building code requirement there in Canada? It's technically, it's been in the code since 2010. It's rarely enforced. Um, honestly, uh, even our local building inspector, it's not even on his radar because he's, <laughs> he's still fighting to have people flash sills correctly. And, you know, he's, he's picking his battles and, and that's fair. Um, if I had a choice between flashing a sill or end dams, I'd, I'd have to say flash the sill first and end dam second. But every every little bit helps. And there's there's also some argument to be made because I've gotten into this with a number of people of the benefits of an end dam versus the the underfold to prevent you know water from getting on top of the head there. I have a, an origami uh, picture in my head that you could actually maybe do both of them at the same time, but I haven't actually tried or figured out how to do it yet. But I think it's possible. 
Oh, look at you. Oh, oh my curtain. <laughs> of course. So, yeah, you, you can do it. It, is, it does take a little more. It, it basically the same thing Aaron just showed, except you make that leg a little bit taller. And the benefit there is if you like to slope the top of your cap flashing oh, yeah. so that the water drains off of it, that you close off the end that would ordinarily be open. Because if you've got a straight piece of head material there, that'd be a little open end. So it's just taking Aaron's exact same thing he did and just bring it down a little more. Instead of one inch, you make two inches or two and a half on that first increment. True artistry. This is really, this is really the craft of what's missing uh, from what we see in the field anyway, uh, in, in our market. There's a lot of guys who know how to make a straight cut and measure to the length of the head casing and that's about it so both of these solutions are so far superior to that uh it kind of makes you sad for the rest of the market <laughs> which is why you did the flashing awareness day right i mean that, that's the whole idea you show people how to do it and then hopefully they take it out in the field and change the world right yeah i'll throw it well, out there i think we we should define what what the what a flashing is and what we're trying to accomplish with it you know, because we just got way into the weeds of, you know, technical abilities there. But what are we trying to do with flashing? Somebody want to take that one on? I'll, uh, can I share my screen again? Sure. You're the technical director. You can do whatever you want. Turn on the laser light show Man. again. <laughs> Absolute power is corrupting absolutely here. So I don't know that I want to take that one on. Can you guys see that? Yeah. So that's flashing in the International Residential Code, the 2018 version, R703.4. So you've got, it really gets pretty detailed in there. There was a question in the chat about the thickness of the gauge. It even gets into fluid applied membranes, um, complying with AAMA 714, where it's required. So like, for example, I think what was shown before was especially continuously above all projecting wood trim. I just hear so many people dog on the code that it's the worst possible way to construct a home. And it's like, well, read through this R703.4 and then see what you think as far as the flashing is concerned. So at least that's a start. And that's just the wall section that you've got there in chapter seven. Then we've got a whole bunch of other stuff outlined in chapter nine, which is the uh, roof covering. So it's, it's all over the exterior of the building. It's not just the wall or not just the roof. It's, it's just all those places. Oh, cable book, Doug. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this was the code book when I started. It probably says flashing, flash things, period. Like it's so much better now. People don't understand. Like I <clears throat> If you actually built something to code, it's probably not that bad. It's but getting the, to Ben's point, get there. But getting back to Ben, your question, like what is flashing? That was I, I wrote that down myself this morning because thinking about this presentation, because the term is not even defined in the code book or anywhere. Um, I just Googled flashing. And of course, you know what you come up with when you Google flashing. Um, it, it, it really, there isn't much in definition, like what it, material it is and what it's supposed to do. Well, it's supposed to shed water. So we can, we can have that discussion, right? Like the whole purpose of the flashing is to direct the water down and out. Uh, so presumably, uh, what was it Rob Yeager said on the podcast way back when? wind driven moisture was the thing we need to protect against which most of us just call rain but also ice melt or any sort of moisture of any kind that we don't want to get into the house that could travel down our siding down over the roof edge and back into the fascia through surface tension it could move upward through wind it could be driven around ends and all of these things are prevented with uh, a thin piece of metal uh, it could be a piece of tape there are all sorts of different materials, as uh, you mentioned already, fluid applied flashings are very effective and easy to detail. So there are a lot of ways to skin the cat. The key is to know the right one to use where for durability. For example, the, the tapes and the fluid applied are often not UV rated. 
So that's why the durable metals are the primary choice for flashings, at least in what I'm seeing. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, or even Call the down panel. <laughs> even vinyl. <laughs> what do you got there, Doug? We oh, we end up using some of this, so but only with backup. It's a um, it's like plastic deck ledger flashing. Oh. Um, but I mean, uh, I mean, I'll just say this: one of my uh, key quality points with all these flashings is the intersect. And I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the question of what the hell a flashing is by itself. But when you when you have to connect two flashings in a watertight manner, um, and the two flashings are changing length over and over, uh, it's it's a very close to a hopeless task. So um, you know, I I do things the way Mike shows in his videos, where if you're using this on top of a deck ledger, you're putting a tape under it. The whole way and then the water that leaks through the joints in this stuff isn't going to cause you any trouble um, redundancy is important it's important to have a backup yeah you know whether it's ice and water shield on a roof before you put your kick out flashing or you know some flashing tape sealing your window to the wall before you put that head flash and end dam on we have a, a question in the audience. Can, can we define, like, what are some of the areas that we need flashings on a building? Oh. You know, I know Brian touched on it there on any what vertical or horizontal projecting wood surface, but we have a lot of situations that aren't horizontally projecting wood surfaces that need flashings. Do we want to run through some of these common places? Transitions. Anytime okay. there's a transition of just about any type, whether you're changing trims, changing siding, uh, wall to roof connections. Going from siding to windows. Yeah. Yeah. So the list goes on. Um, Basically any projection from the WRB or from the roof covering. Oh, I like that. Right. Well, it could also it, be, it could also be in, you know, butt joints between lap siding or between uh, siding and, and trim, vertical joints as well as, as horizontal joints. A lot of times we don't think about those being backed up by flash and we think the WRB is going to do, do all the work back there, but the more we can keep the water on the surface of the exterior, be it the exterior of the roof or the exterior of the siding, the better off we're going to be and not put too much water behind the siding or the roofing. Yeah, pretty important. It kind of just seems a catch all phrase for like any water shedding juncture. I mean, it's almost like French drain. It means a lot of different things, right? I tend to think of flashing as just something that prevents bulk water from getting to the interior of the building. And building in the Pacific Northwest, that is our number one thing that we have to keep track of is just keeping water out of the interior. And we've used a lot of different systems, Zip, um, Tyvek, you know, all sorts of things. They all work as long as they're installed right. But that's pretty much been our building failures is when mm -hmm. a human makes a mistake. And if you can just visualize how the water is going to fall, I don't want to dominate the discussion. This might sound a little weird, but if you can visualize yourself like as small as an ant or Ant-Man, if you're a Marvel Comics guy, what's that water going to do? Because if there's a space that's small enough for an ant, the water's going to hit that and get in somewhere. So if we can just keep that shedding to the outside of each layer and each transition all the way down to the ground, because I think that's another part, especially if you've got expansive soils that you have to keep track of. It's not just the wood framed wall, but if you've got expansive soils or um, say you've got expansive soils and a, a, a frost depth that you have to keep track of, you can really wreak havoc on the structure of the building. Um, so not just cosmetic drywall, but even concrete cracking and failure. Yeah, and I got I was gonna go straight there with the woo woo stuff later. Like, you, you know, you really got to, you have to be the drop of water. You know, just pretend, like a imagine yourself, leave you the plane of our existence 
anyway, it's um, yeah, it's that's that actually was, was probably one of the most influential things anyone ever said to me, and I think I read it in a book in the in the early '90s, and uh, it just or, or uh, yeah, anyway, and it uh, you know completely changed how I started building stuff. Um, very helpful way to approach this. What's the what's gravity going to do to the water? The one thing that gets really confusing though is, and I know two of you guys are in these places where in um, you know if you're near the coast, it's not it's not just what gravity is going to do to the water, right? And that's why Aaron and and Mike built to have flashings that are literally two or three times as high as what we use. So I, I'm actually curious about that for both of you guys. I know you you you're Mike. You've talked about how you use upgrade thickness. Um, metal and and make things taller or wider and then Aaron I was going to ask you this too because when you when you cut off the end of that thing and it fell on the floor it made this thunk that made me think it was like twice <laughs> as thick as what I use no um that would probably be uh 28 gauge so it yeah it's not super super heavy um step up from 30 but we're not into like commercial 22 or 24 or anything like that. Usually what I'm seeing, we're seeing 28, 26 gauge for the most part, unless it's specifically roof flashings on standing seam roofs or like copper details. So speaking of, you know, materials a little bit there, are there, any uh, issues that we need to be concerned with, with the material type choices that we're using for our flashings? Depends on what you're using it in conjunction with. Um, you always have to be mindful of uh, galvanic reaction, especially in a coastal environment. So if you're you know, doing some type of steel siding, uh, you definitely don't want to use aluminum flashing. Do you do you see stuff like that happen on that on you know like on walls and stuff uh, in your climate? You can, yeah, I, I have seen it. I mean, around here, every roof is put together with aluminum flashing and electro galvanized nails, and they don't really seem to fail before the rest of the roof in my climate. It's a hit and miss thing here with uh, electro galvanized nails. If the roof is well installed and the shingles are all sealed down nicely, well, they don't get wet um, unless there's stuff going on in the attic, but that's, <laughs> that's another story. Um, but if the roof is not well installed or is experiencing a lot of wind driven rain, then I've seen it where the heads are gone and then once the head leaves, the next thing you know, well, shingles start leaving. I guess I have seen that too. When you have a persistent leak through the shingles, it will rust out the nails real quick. No. And then I, I put this picture up. This, these are two different um, pieces of aluminum that were sitting on pressure treated, one for about six months. And that's wow. the one on the top. And then the one on the bottom was about a year. So it, it goes quick. I, mean, I don't know if you can even tell what this is, but uh, <laughs> you know this this is the aluminum that's left. You know this part, and then this is where it it was like a powder on the back of the joist. So it, it's pretty quick. Chemistry always wins. So aside from knowing which flashing details, right, I, I've heard several of you say, like, it depends, right, how you put it together, um, uh, right, get, <laughs> right, sorry, got a drink on that one. <laughs> that was a topic from last week, wasn't it? it that was last week, you know. I think so, it's an instituted law now. So aside from the fact that they need to know what they're supposed to be flashing and how they're supposed to be flashing, they also need to know what materials react with each other. And so this is, um, you know, I think a common problem is more materials become available. I mean, not that we're talking about certain specific things, but, you know, how do we get the data from stuff like the photos that Doug's showing out to the people who need to have it? Like, hey, guys, this is, you know. I don't know that's always the struggle that i think 
we're missing sharing some of that. I mean, I say we're missing sharing some of that data, although Aaron with your flashing day uh, blew up the internet with bad flashing stuff, which was awesome, right? Getting some of that data out there. But, you know, I just, is it just something you learned over time in the field? I mean, that's kind of what, what Doug has said over time, right? Done, do done bad things, trying to fix them, do better things. I, like, I don't know. What's the, what's the answer to that? Well, I know locally anyways, uh, some pressure treat will come with a little sticker stable to the end of it. And it'll say right on it, do not put in contact with aluminum. I don't know if that's a thing in the States as well. Um, no. The pressure treat see- the aluminum council would have nothing, nothing to do with that. <laughs> Down here, you just have to direct message Mike Gurton and say, is this okay? Down I've here, done that. What's wrong with that? Getting flashes Hashtag on ask pleasures. Mike. I don't know. <laughs> ask that Mike. <laughs> it applies for both. Well, this is why you so see so are- many builders using or being devoted to a specific system of products that play well together but that really typically does not extend to the metals. You usually will see a very comprehensive list of, you know, if you're gonna do whatever, I was gonna say Huber Zip, but everybody gives me crap about being a shill for this product or that product. So let's say uh, Blue Skin, let's say Henry, they've got a whole system. And if you use their tapes and their product, then you don't have problems with their self-adhered membrane to their flashing tapes to whatever you lap it over until you get to the metal and then it's right back to i don't know what does the petroleum do to the metal i don't know what does the pressure treated wood do to the metal and you really have to educate yourself i guess that's why you have to follow aaron and and mike and everyone else and watch the bs and beer show or what else is there another resource does your do, do architects have this sort of uh responsibility raining down on them as well where it's not just the builder's fault if it fails but it's the architect's fault if he does if he or she does not specify the type of metal, the gauge of metal, the flashing detail. I've never seen that on prints, never. I I think uh, that depends on who you ask, right? If you ask Steve Basic, he says that it's his job to know how all of these things go together, what, you know. I don't know if he takes it quite as far as material interaction, but it's his job to understand how all of this, all of these products come together, goes in the drawing and can, can be done on site. But at the same time, he's not, wingnut testing in his backyard and taking a look at it right so then there's still some reliability with our build trade to come back to us and say hey by the way that totally didn't work because there aren't enough people taking these materials smashing them together leaving them for a certain amount of time and in conditions that we have that are different in different places they're different in canada they're different in the midwest they're different in the northeast they're different on the coast and then saying oh yeah by the way that was a bad idea you know we keep learning it the hard way so i mean i'd like to see the architecture community and some of that stuff being led a little bit but at the same time we also will put um, specification requirements on our drawings so that we're not product specific. So that depending on the build trade, you could get another product if your supplier carries something that is an equal product, right? So it's kind of messy, really. Um, it's also, the the architect gets into a tricky position where they start to assume liability if they're the ones specifying, right. you know, the means and methods and the materials. Yeah, so it's kind of um. We're gonna end up in the commercial contract world here if we start going down that route. Um, <laughs> no, thank you. This is why it's good to be Brian Euler and build specs, and then you can kind of control more of this, right, Brian? Like, can't you just decide and then do it? Well, that. Yeah, you know, I'm listening to all of this and I have no answer, but I can't remember one of the bios that was just being told. Our company motto is we've done everything wrong at least once, which gives the implication that sometimes we've done the wrong thing more than one time. It has just been a hard fought learning battle of failure after failure. And you scratch your head going, why is this happening? 
And you learn way more than all of the times you just happen to get it right, but you have no idea why you got it right. I think of one case where it was three levels, super exposed building, and uh, the wind would come in. And typically, we don't have a lot of wind-driven rain here, but it was up on a hill, and the wind would just you know, pile onto the front of that house. And we had this water leak that we chased. One of our employees still has PTSD from it. Like you can't even bring up that house. It just freaks them out. I was up there trying to figure it out. I ended up having to like draw and learn the assembly. How did this thing go together? And what it boiled down to was two main mistakes. There was a, there was a roof that, or I'm sorry, a window that came down, a shed roof that came up really close to the bottom of it. That roof sheathing was probably OSB and it wasn't taped to the sidewall. It was zipped. So that was mistake number one. Then when the roofing paper went on, that wasn't taped to the zip. Had either of those things happened, I think we would have been okay, but especially the top one. Then we took a piece of sheeting and put it on that for a finished piece. And there was some trim that went on the outside of that that never got caulked. Had that joint been caulked, it would have been face sealed. Not the best way to do it, but I'm telling you what, we probably wouldn't have had all the, the failures that we had. So it's for us a case of kind of caveat emptor. It's like buyer beware. There's nobody back checking our flashing details. It's we better know what we're doing or we're going to have the callback with thousands of dollars and tough lessons learned. I'm in a, in a good spot because both of my kids seem to be interested in construction. So via osmosis, they're picking this stuff up. Um, so that's a very, very grassroots way to do it. But I guarantee they know more than I did. And they're, you know, 10 and five, but they're getting these principles down just by going to the job site and, and learning. You just have to burn up children to populate the workforce and then we'll be fine. <laughs> I mean, that was how that, it worked, wasn't it? <laughs> that's really the, the answer. Like, I can't, I haven't come across any one source that's going to teach you how to, you know, flash a building. You know, it really is, is you become aware of the principles and the fundamentals of how to flash something. And then when you're out on the job site, you start going, oh, what the hell do I do here? Oh, what the hell do I do here? And then eventually you remember that spot that you had trouble with and you find a product, you find a method or something that solves it later. And you just add that into your repertoire. So I, I wish there was something that we could turn to, Mr. Curtin. Well, you know, where, where the whole thing falls apart, even if the designers design something or you've learned something along the way is when you call the lumber yard to ask for something to be delivered. And when I call for cap flashing, this is a inch and five sixteenths cap flashing. This is what I get. It's got an inch and an eighth back leg it's made, uh, it's got a minimum quarter inch drip leg. And it's of course 90 degrees, so it's not gonna shed water. And this is what people will install. Um, and this is the best flashing that the lumber yard has. This is a professional lumber yard. I can go to four lumber yards within 10 minutes of where I live and they're all gonna have the same thing. It's commodity product, it's cheap. This is what the installers install. Um, you know, probably at least in New England where I am, you know, 80%, 90% of our work is not on new construction where there might be an architect involved or a designer who's specifying, you know, the wall leg or different details. And when Mike Maines designed the uh, pro home we did in 2016 for fine home building, he had a really nice flashing detail and included an extra cap over the window that was sloped so that we just bent our metal to that. But that's not very common on a replacement and repair market, um, residing, re-roofing. So it's left up to the installers. Step flashing. When I go and call for a step flashing, I get this thing. This has not even met our building code in the United States and in my state for at least the last six years. It's a it's a five by seven flashing card. And it's also too thin. It doesn't meet the thickness. So that I think that's the biggest failure is in the suppliers that we get our materials from. They could stock what the code minimum is, and then perhaps that at least would get people thinking about, or at least using some better products. 
I think I said this a couple of weeks ago um, that I think it would be awesome if our supply houses all had a building scientist like on staff too, right? Because, um, you know, Mike and I, uh, you know, when we were doing in person, we had a, a topic and we said WRBs, right? And that might have been where it depends first started uh, <laughs> happening. Um, but they were like, well, what, how do I know what to use? And the first place to go, right, is your supplier. And they're going to send you that stuff, Mike, right? They're going to, they're going to like, well, this is what we have on the shelf. And it's like, oh, even if you have a great architect or designer like Mike that, you know, detailed this stuff, it's like, well, this is what we have, right? And so even if the detail calls for something different, you're like, well, this, this flashing is the same as that flashing. Right. So like, okay, you know, and we move forward. I think that's a failure on our supply houses to not know the material compositions of what they're selling or whether or not what they're selling actually works for the product that's supposed to be like, you know, I, I go back to, to, you know, flashing or, or WRBs or whatever, like they're not all created equal. It, it, it does, what you're doing matters. And they don't talk about that. There's like, here's what's on the shelf. Here you go. And um, just like food and drug administration, though, like you have, we do have some use for government in this country. I don't want to take it into that realm, but there are some, some applications uh, for oversight. Like, I, I don't want doctors using un, untested methods on me. And there's a, a, a guiding light that pushes that. And you can take supplements, but they won't, the FDA doesn't say this will actually work and do the job. You can still buy them though. So I guess that's kind of that gray area. Shouldn't there be, can that be part of the code somehow? Can they get some massive government overreach to go into the supply houses and say, you can't have this tiny flashing this isn't a really a step flashing. Mike Gurton won't use this. Come on, what can we do here? Crickets. That's what we can I'd do. I'd be it's happy. I'd be happy if they just had compatibility posted everywhere. Like, can you use this primer with this product? Can you use this tape with this product? You know, um, I'm running out of VP uh butyl tape and i've got to finish the job can i use 3m tape to finish the job because i don't know <laughs> yeah someone posted in the chat box they don't want to take the responsibility for it and that and i get that but i'm not necessarily asking you to take responsibility i'm asking like i have this product can i use this one with it right or i have this condition do i need a seven inch flashing or do I need a five inch flashing, you know, and, and they're all really locally specific. Right. So, you know, they, in theory, should have a better understanding of what's available in your market too. Right. Cause that's always the hard part is, you know, I loved it was, it was sometime last year and we were on and we were talking about, you know, sloping window sills and using shingles and, and, uh, you know, or using a clapboard and Doug's like, we'd never do that here. You know how expensive that would be. And it's like, oh yeah. Right. Obviously the same things don't work in different places because of availability. And yeah, I love the idea of you know, compatibility charts or what's in this, right? Because half the time, isn't it just, you know, like maybe you know that this thing and this thing don't go together, but you don't have any idea what's in it. Like, I don't know. What's... Now, granted, you look at the red list and the ingredient thing and you just kind of blank out a bunch of chemicals you can't pronounce just like the FDA on the back of your, <laughs> your stuff. But I mean, I think... It would be really helpful if someone just asked you the question like, oh, you know, I'm I'm using a double stud wall system and I want to put zip board on here. And it's like, yeah, that's probably not a good idea. But, you know, I just I don't know. There's a lot of times you have to learn and there's this doesn't get back to like one touchstone place where we can go for answers. But you have to learn to just you have to check with the manufacturers of the products you're using. Most of them will have listed documents with compatible materials that can be used with their product, even if it's not their product, you know? And worst case scenario is, is you're learning, you know, for 
sealants and tapes, you're learning there's like three or four classes of product that they could be. And I find myself ending up having to go into pulling up the MSDSs for the products in order to find out what chemical it is. You know, is it a butyl? Is it an asphaltic? Is it a modified? Is it an acrylic? There we go. It, it, so I, I get it, but I don't know. It's, it's a tough question. It, it, some of it has to be the responsibility of the independent tradesperson or the designer or the installer to learn their product. And the problem is, is that we have a dearth of people that don't take that initiative. So I have no great answer there, but. I have came a up question. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say something came up in the chat box. I'm not very good at following the chat box, but Hans mentioned something about, you know, like, oh, this is something in Germany, but are some of these flashing detail failures simply trades that should be doing flashing and aren't because somebody else is doing flashing? He mentioned something about roofers and they're really trained well because they're also doing flashing with stuff. Is it, is it, I don't know. Is it a combination of who's doing the part before the person shows up and the next person having material? And should some of these details be done by the person who's putting something over it? I don't know. That's no, a good question. You're bringing up a, a good point because the <laughs> Where we put flashings is where different materials are touching each other. And sometimes there are different people putting those materials together. So whose job is it to um, put those to, to prepare for the next trade? So each of those people that are doing those trades, they are in one way say, well, I don't want to get too much into specifics, but they, if you're not preparing for the next trade to come in and do their job properly, then the next trade may not be able to do their job properly and then they were each pointing fingers at each other because if something doesn't work and it comes down to the flashing you can think of it as step flashing or continuous flashing along a roof to wall connection kick out flashings and even uh exterior trim which is sometimes installed at a, by a different person than it, who is installing the siding and then that could be different than the person who's doing the the wrb the house wrap and you know the flashings aren't done and integrated with those. So there's a timing component and there's a trade component. And that makes this whole issue of flashing a lot more complicated than most installers think that it is. Because they're usually gone on to three more jobs before. And, and a lot of times these leaks that take place due to improper flashing take many, many, many years to discover. And by that point, as we all know, the damage is done. And it costs the owner, you know, many thousands or tens of thousands of dollars because it's concealed damage that, you know, walls that need to be completely rebuilt. Anyway, going on. <laughs> yeah, actually, I actually have a, a slide to share that I think falls on Mike's. It's it's a good good one to share based on Mike's comment. Uh, I'm sure everybody involved in this thought that they were doing a perfectly good job. Oh, can everybody see that? Okay. Um, looks good from here oh yeah it did look good no no doug that looks bad that was a bad example not a good example <laughs> no pictures like that are priceless yeah and i mean i know um i mean every every construction company has someone who is man trying to manage quality uh on some level and um you know i mean i'm i'm, I'm personally just lucky in a place to be in a place where we have a lot of people and I've, I've gotten to focus on that. Uh, but I think what Mike just said is really, really true that a lot of, you know, I, I, I never learned any of this crap while I was building houses. I was too busy building them. And then, uh, you know, when I started fixing houses, when I was like, Oh my God, we really need to, we really need to be doing this better. And, uh, any, any repeating problem, uh, becomes the subject of, uh, various forms of education and discussion around our company. But, um, yeah, I think every company, I mean, Brian doesn't have 85, or we have 91 people now, 91 people in their company. So uh, he's probably doing that himself. Um, and I, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think that's not happening. I just think that, especially for the actual people working in the field, a lot of them never see the building again. 
and just don't have the opportunity to learn. Uh, and along with all the other pressures on them to do things fast and not um, not waste any time or money. That's, I think Doug, you, you, you have just... to analyze. Sorry, go right ahead, I, Brian. I think you have to analyze each building and how you're constructing it on its own. Analyze your uh, the form of your the structure of your own company. So, for example, we're very fortunate. My brother, we've worked together for 20 plus years. I trust him implicitly. He gets it. We use the same system over and over. But if we're subbing things out, then you have to have at least one person who's highly knowledgeable who will be there with the subcontractor and walk them through it, not like a jerk, not overlording it, but making sure that it's done a particular way, talk through it. If they're doing it all day, they might know something that we don't. But again, if you're subbing it out and you've got a lot of people, you have to be much more structured with your quality assurance program. You can't just leave it up to chance and say, well, they're the sub, they must know what they're doing. Not necessarily. So not around here. Yeah, I, I'm fortunate to work with some very good subs and I still have to actively manage them on a regular basis. Um, and Doug hit on a point that, you know, it's sad to say, but I think a lot of the issues we see are the result of the race to the bottom. It's everything's been so value engineered. Guys are just expected like, hey, you've got to get that wall completely sided today trimmed and sided today so they you know they don't want to climb off of the pump jacks to go down there and find that head flashing out of the truck so they just roll past it someone said on one of the other bs and beer shows and i don't remember who it was so pardon me that they assign an air sealing person on every job right like it's their job to make sure that after every subcontractor was you travis that someone walks around and checks all the air seal like you look for holes that people put through on their roof staging or whatever you know that's going through like maybe there needs to be a flashing guy or gal or whatever on every job whose job is to know what your flashings are supposed to be and check them out before the night you know like i don't know is that a thing like it ah, it seems crazy that you you need that but you need that we need that with every aspect of building though. Someone has to take responsibility for everything. It's typically the general because they're the one who's going to get sued and have to rebuild it. Uh, but usually if you make someone take ownership of a thing, you get a better outcome regardless of whatever the element is. Uh, and certainly I have found that to be the case in our small operation. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, just throwing this out there locally, uh, most municipalities in Canada, you get a pre-backfill inspection, you get a pre-drywall inspection, sometimes you get a framing inspection, depending on your location, and then you get a final. What if we threw a building envelope inspection in there that included air barrier flashing? I understand that building step. inspector check flashings. And I insulation have... details, I wanna throw that in there. I mean, <laughs> so as a HERS rater, we don't, do flashing although maybe we should add that to to the list of things that we regularly inspect when you're having a hers rating done on the house but you know it, i i totally agree with that like those are such critical parts of the built environment now like why aren't we looking at that i so wonder if any of you have heard from a, a heard of this but some friends of mine who work in victoria out in british columbia on vancouver island they said that before they can get a building permit, they have to have a, I guess you could call it a weatherization engineer who actually designs the WRB system, the window flashing, and at least that layer. And then that same person who designs that as part of the plan submittal has to come out and verify before any cladding goes on the walls or the roof that all of those details on the window flashing at least and door flashing and the wrb are all done properly has anybody heard anything more about that or know anything about that i've heard that's, the same thing mike uh, sorry that's where bc is going um the national building code would be here and bc's building code is about here um basically I'm sure you've all heard of the condo crisis in the 90s that BC had. Um, no. Um, 
Well, the Building Science Corporation did some great studies after it happened, but basically the provincial um, home warranty program went bankrupt during when all this, there was this massive building boom and there was all these condos that went up really quickly, really badly. And due to lack of details, they all leaked and the structural issues and whatnot was just out of this world. And it, it bankrupted the, uh, the local home warranty uh, company. So after that, BC has just been, you know, sort of taking the bull by the horns and they've been trying to improve building code wherever they can. And um, basically they're, I think, pushing for all new builds net zero 2030, I think. So that's, you know, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, leaky right. condo crisis. For anybody that's not familiar with it, if you Google leaky condo crisis, it, it'll pop right up. You know, there's been mention of, you know, hiring, you know, building envelope specialists. You know, I think the, the, the this, which is an excellent option, but I think the sad fact is, is that uh, the vast majority of builders in our country don't know that there are building envelope specialists that they could hire and that for, you know, probably a relatively reasonable fee, they could get a good set of details handed to them that they could follow or somebody to come out and walk the project. So is anybody... Go ahead, Mike. Or just I'm wondering um, if anybody knows how one becomes a building envelope specialist, because it seems like that's a that's a growth industry right there. <laughs> it's what is the Air Barrier Association of America, the WRB Association, or whatever it is. There's a couple of trade organizations. I bet. Yep. Call Ben Larson in the chat. Ben Larson is our guy. Where you at, Ben? Post your contact. <laughs> well, I also think. You know, too, with the, the teaching and training, you know, as architects, we have to do continuing education. In some places, there's, you know, contractors that have to do continuing education. Um, and as an architect, we love beautiful things that are different, but, you know, and we don't want people doing it the same way they've been doing it for 25 years, because obviously the, the technology changes. But at the same time, if we adopted some similar systems where we only had to change five things instead of everything in the system, would that help us? You know, I think um, in Canada, you have the step code kind of increasing the code. We are supposed to increase the code every three years. You know, if as a building industry, we just met whatever the current one was that was available, you know, and we had traditional details that we adopted one to five things that changed every year. And I don't know, like, why is everything different every time? I mean, is that our fault as designers here? I'll, I'll take one for the team since I'm the only architect here. Oh, Mike's Mike counts. He's not an architect, but he's a designer. He counts, whatever. So he might have to take one for the team too here. Like, is it, is it us? Do we just make you do it different every time? We're just, no, we, it's not just you as builders. I think we can all admit to doing what we like to do, regardless of what's on the plan. You can design it however you want, Emily. When it comes to me, I'm still going to tell the client. Yeah, it's a great detail. If we were in Maine, I'm not doing that. This is the product I favor. This is the system that my sub can install effectively. Like Brian already said, the best system is the one that's installed properly. If we have comfort with a system that we know that we don't have to come back and pay to warranty failure, that's what we're pushing on the client. And the client has already trusted me to build it. So I, always, I, I have said this before, if the architect will come out and replace this when it fails, I will do it the way they've drawn it. Let me know what they say. And I don't do it to be a jerk, but we do get some bad plan details from time to time. And I am the one who's holding the bag. So I'm sure that your details are fantastic. And I wouldn't have that if it was a, an Emily Mottram designed house. Unfortunately, a lot of the times I've built non-Emily Mottram designed 
you're, you're not going to get an Emily Mottram design because if I gave you something that was appropriate for Maine, it would never be appropriate for your area. And that's what people don't understand. And it's super frustrating. Like, you know, someone comes to us and they're like, I found this plan online. It's like, great. It was designed in 2005 for the West coast where they don't get snow. Like that's not appropriate here, you know? And so I hope I never give you a zone six, uh, you know, super insulated house for Kansas city. Cause that would just not be appropriate. Um, I don't know your climate, so that would be terrible. And I don't, you know, I'm sure I've put out bad details too. And as architects, and I, I love this from Steve basic too, when he says it is like, we've got to go to the job site and we've got to find out from you what is impossible to do. Right. Cause some things are pretty easy to do in CAD that are super difficult to do in the field. And, you know, that's, that's a failure of details and systems too. It's like, well, this flashing detail looks great on this plan, but it's like damn near impossible to actually replicate in the field. And we need to own those things too. So one of the things I've noticed, too, with um, when I have received plans that do have flashing details outlined on them is that it's in plan view. So we'll see, you know, a cap flashing, but there's not that you almost need a three dimensional design for a lot of these crazy details, I even think pan flashing for a for a window where we're amongst us, we know just what that means and whether we want to do a back dam or a slope. But when you turn that into three dimension, it's really hard to put it on a piece of paper. And, and getting that kind of information out to people in three dimensions, it's almost like it has to be done in video or in person in order to really convey the information accurately. So I'd like to piggyback on Mike's comment. If you did that, you can do a layer isometric where it's in a 3D view and you show three different or four or five or six different components. And that's going to go blow somebody's mind. It's like, then the architect better have layered everything perfectly. Instead, extract that out into six different isometrics that show the different levels of the installation of each different sequence. detail. If you did the sequence of installation, then do a video that shows that with somebody who is visually explaining it, couple those things and you'll be able to get much better installations. Then it'll be repeatable. And then at the end of each window, if you really wanna cover yourself liability wise, make sure that the tradesperson takes a picture of every window of how it was installed. And that, that's you know one other thing, again, I don't, I'm very fortunate. We work with the same trade partners on every one of our projects. So we're building institutional knowledge. We make mistakes together, we fix them together, things happen. And then we learn that for the next time. So if we, if we did that, took more pictures and had a nice insular group of people, then we're covering each other all the way through. We're kind of in the whole boat together. And I know that's not a national solution, but it's a local solution to that problem. I think it could be a national solution. And I said this last week, I'm going to throw Ben Bogey onto their bus again. A QR code on your drawing set, watching Ben Bogey install that specific detail that's under eight and- minutes. Who doesn't have a smartphone on a job site that's like, they want me to do what here and an actual physical install of it doing it um, and a plug for an upcoming show that we have for construction instruction. There are some people who are starting to do this, who are making these short videos and we need to access the data that's already out there. Somebody showing you. And I mean, there has to be like about 5 billion of these for regional specifics. Like you were saying, Brian Euler, you know, it's, it's, it's your local thing. It's, it's something you've done. One of these times, just take a video of one person doing it and it can end up on every one of your drawing sets moving forward. This is how we installed this window. This is how we installed this kick out flashing in our market. This is how, you know, and we can create that data 
and we have the ability to add QR codes. And you know what? The, somebody reached out to me after I mentioned that on one of these shows and said, we can put the QR code on the tape so that it's right on the flashing detail that goes directly onto the X, Y, Z of whatever you have. It's right there. It's like, boom, hey, uh, here's a thing. We're going to have to look at this. We need to know what this is or what's going over this. Or, you know, so there's, I mean, we can print on anything now. So, so I, so I'm going to look into my copyrights here after the show, but yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> no, the, and not yeah. to play Debbie Downer here or naysayer, but uh, one of the issues that we run into is, is number one, architects are expensive and a lot of clients other than the select few don't want to pay for an architect to generate all the details because the builder is going to say, Hey, I got it. I know what we're using. They don't want to pay to have the architect generate them on most projects. The other thing is, is it's tough for architects to generate a standard set of details because they're going to generate a standard set of details and then it's going to go to a dozen different builders and each one of those builders is going to take that detail and change it. So. I mean, I again, find- Here I, I am get, with no I, great answer. I'm, uh, I steal detail. Well, actually I borrow details with permission uh, from people, but I'm always like, and then at this point, Picture five, we don't do that. You know, we, we, here's, here's picture four from the other company. That's what we do. So that now I'll go back to picture six. Anyway, it's, a, it, it is, uh, I think, you know, there, there are a lot of them. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. And actually, that's what, that's what we've done. I have this uh, terrible YouTube channel with me talking for an hour about anything you want to see. But, um, I'm sure so that, that's not terrible. Somebody put the link in the chat box. We all need to yeah, watch that. We, we um, <laughs> no, I mean these are we do company trainings, and and that's what that's what they are. Is we have uh, you know pictures, or we do demonstrations, and and um, or both, and that's how we tr try to tell everyone how we're doing it here. Um, but that's a pretty big investment, um, and I mean I think there's a lot of good good points about building a community of practice and helping everyone understand the general principles behind them. That's, you know, principle-based education is, is a phrase that I heard a few years ago and, and just keep trying to work more towards that as much as I can. Um, and I think you can kind of get there, but it's just complicated, you know, no matter how many times you, how, however good your details are that apply 90% of the time, every building has a couple of weird corners, especially in re renovations. And, um, you know, we, we just have to go out there and puzzle those out. The yeah, thing is, I, is sorry. I was going to say, there's definitely not an easy solution to it. And I think it's a communications problem, right? Like that answer doesn't get back to the architect and the builders don't share it with each other because maybe XYZ builder would do it Ben's way, but he's never done it that way before. He didn't see it and it might be easier, but he's never seen it. I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that was basically where I was going. Communication, but we... We live in an age where communication has actually never been easier. I mean, truly, right? Um, you know, I'm sure some of you had a Sony Walkman growing up. I mean, <laughs> anyways, my point is, is would you have thought then that you'd be having a Zoom call with these many people and being able to share ideas and stuff, um, you know? There's so many platforms where you can reach out to somebody who has fixed or is in the process of fixing what you're building today. So, you know, whether it be reaching out to Ben or, or Mike or, or Doug and say, hey, I'm, I'm building this. I think you did something similar a few years ago when you repaired something. What was the actual issue there? What can I do better? And, you know, I get not everybody's going to do that but the option is there for the people to care. So Ben might be able to help me out. Bill Spone on the Building HVAC Science podcast. If I remember right, he had an expression like, and this is, this is definitely pre-COVID. It was like sneeze on, a dip, sneeze on one person every day. And, and what he meant by that was not literal sneezing, but expressing something teaching wise with, of course, that was building HVAC science, but it's the same idea, taking a teaching approach. It's way too complicated to expect to teach all of these principles. That was a comment made in the chat earlier. What's one principle that everybody 
Well, there's just a lot of them. But if you start thinking about it and building your knowledge just one brick at a time, before you know it, you've got a brick wall. But it has to be that one thing at a time. So for us, again, it is about rainwater. Having slope away from the foundation is so incredibly critical. I can't tell you how many houses my dad built. He would always fight with the excavating contractor because the excavating contractor wanted the foundation higher. Well, my dad wanted to save money. So we would have lower foundations and we wouldn't get good positive slope. I can't tell you how much time I've spent around foundations or in crawl spaces, all for the, the sake of a little bit of money. But understanding that slope, okay, are we gonna slope our garages? What slope is this roof pitch? What slope is the shower pan? Is there a slope in a, in a sink? It's all about slope. And once you get that principle, you can start applying a lot of these things. So, so you're saying let's get rid principle. of our levels. How much no, slope? No more levels. <laughs> that's the problem with builders is we always think we want things level. But you're saying you don't when it comes to water. Wouldn't we all be happier if nothing was level because nothing is ever level, right? <laughs> you want it flat, but not necessarily level. Mm. Unless it's a hardwood floor, in which case you want it level. Yeah, it, it's understanding the intent behind what you're building. What's the end use of it going to be? But be intentional when you do need a slope. If you don't have a slope, then you have to know you've got to pressurize something and move it from point A to point B. Well, now you have to know that you've got to use mechanical advantage and use electricity to do that. I mean, it's all so interrelated, but it takes a long time to learn. So having that culture of learning and listening, because the trades I work with know their trade better than me in most things, not everything. So having that balance of when to humbly listen and go with what they say, and then get that relationship where you can push back when you need to. And then at the end of the day, everybody ends up happier. I'm, I'm curious, we probably only got a 15 minutes left or so, I guess. What, what's everybody's favorite flashing? Favorite because it's a place where they see problems or it's a place where they see it done well all the time. Go ahead, Ben. What's your favorite flashing? <laughs> uh, my favorite, the one that I consistently sun, see done wrong and there's so many products and ways to do it well is HVAC line sets. Like the yeah. best case scenario is, is I see that they cut the fat end off of the caulk tube and applied it with three fingers. That's generally a good job. But well, what's a good way? What's a good way to do it then? Uh, like the quick flash panels, um, those are great products. You can take a piece of three-inch PVC with a forty-five and bore a three-inch hole before they put the line sets through, and stick a piece of three-inch PVC through. You could just bend a little kick-out flashing of metal over top of it to divert the water out and away from it. Yeah. That's the one that's constant, and it's a huge hole, and it's never touched. All right, there's my soapbox moment. I like that one because not a lot of people think about that one, and and more and more homes around the country are getting air conditioning that didn't get them 30 or 40 years ago. So for a lot of tradespeople, that's a new hole in the wall that they don't really know that that uh, quick flash boot that comes out is is even available. Was your question, Mike, what's our favorite flashing? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, what I'm into right now is inside and outside corners at the base of a wall where it intersects hardscape. And that's, again, being principle-based. If you can cut baseboard or, you know, you've got inside and outside corners, you might measure up a whole house and say, what are your inside and outside corners? To recognize you have inside and outside corners on the outside of your house figure out how to cut your metal so everything overlaps properly. And then you're just that little bit, it doesn't take much metal, but it's gonna shed to the hardscape instead of dripping straight down, getting between that joint and maybe undermining your asphalt. You know, we just did a couple of asphalt projects. That's why it's on my brain. Concrete won't get affected as much for us, but asphalt will definitely get undermined and then we'll have sinkage problems. A lot of the old houses like had a lot of the older houses had a, a water table trim and 
we can do that with all kinds of, you know, PVC, aluminum type of flashings. And it's uh, extremely important in some of the older renovations, especially if you've got uh, a rock or, or stone foundation, just to keep you know, the mortar joints and very often. Somebody's got to say it. Kick out flashes. Yeah. Boring. This is, you this say is boring. What I, yeah. No, I did. I did, but I, of course I'm. Of course I'm joking. Um, yeah. Actually, funny story. The first house I ever did with uh, with Eves on it. Uh, me and the roofer looked at that corner at that intersection. And we said this is not going to work. Yeah, and we had to. Uh, we sort of like made up a kick out flashing, which probably leaked a little later. But this is this is my favorite these days uh, is figuring out th through flashing and making sure it gets done well with end dams because uh, I mean an incredible amount of water goes through masonry and especially we just we just had a couple of uh, slow moving heavy storms come through here put four inches of rain down in half an hour and that'll make your I mean your those bricks are full of water and if you don't have these things set up right it's all coming in that's my two cents. Oh, and that, that's a, yeah, that's a super great, actually, let me just reshare this. This, this is one of these things where you can read the book by its cover. You can judge the book by it. So this is the cover of the Michigan Masonry Institute Guide to Inspecting Residential Brick Veneer. It's like all the information is actually there on the cover. Really nice. It's my kind of book. Yeah. Even I can finish that one. Yeah. <laughs> Graphics. Yes, uh, so we something have, we haven't kick, met. Go ahead, Mike. Oh no, just with kick out flashing, or just I I shared the image earlier of, of, of what happens if you don't have kick out flashing. And I've never, I mean, I've probably seen inside 200 renovations, and I can't remember a single one that where that that, that had kick out flashing and and that didn't have have water damage there. But even the most clever homemade ones or the or the worst ones just I, I think they're ugly and I find that I, I'm pretty sure I've had, had good luck without actually pushing it away from the wall as long as it kicks out onto the wall below so it's sort of like a flush kick out flashing I wish I had a picture of it but I don't mm -hmm. um, it, it takes it takes uh, several steps I've never been able to successfully teach anybody uh, the method but you guys guys ever do that just sort of like have, have, have basically the, the lower piece of the step flashing tucks behind the fascia and just kicks out onto the face of the wall below it. And so you, you see some of it. You do that, Mike? Yeah, if you've got, it, it works if you've got uh, lap siding, it works really easily. Shingles mm -hmm. a little more complicated. And if you're into stucco or other things, other materials, stone makes it a little more difficult. But I know just what you mean. All you've got to do is right where that first piece of step flashing is, instead of just pushing it up against your house wrap you got to bring it out over the top of one of the uh head laps of whatever that next course is and that way any water does get to there it just kind of weeps out and what i do in that case is i just take a couple toothpicks and jam them up under there just to give a little weep space so that water doesn't get totally dammed up back there and it and it really helps hmm. my my favorite flashing is one that i i've started you know, when you start remodeling and working on and maintaining old houses, you start to realize that <clears throat> you got to think about the next person who's going to come along. And it, it with no matter what we do today, there's going to be whether we're roofing or siding, those or even window installation, somebody's going to be replacing that stuff 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years from now. And if you have a, if just take the extra little step and thinking about what would make their job easier so that they don't have to rip off the adjacent material, particularly with roofs and ripping off the siding in order to get step flashing in there. So my new favorite flashing is counter flashing. Yeah. So what a lot of contractors think of, particularly if they're putting a flashing from a roof to a wall is they think, well, I'm going to make this perfect. And, 
you know, they've gotten familiar with zip systems. So you just put a tape over the, the, from the, the zip to the flashing. And I think that's actually the worst thing you can do because now you've got to rip the whole siding off in order to get, because now you've stuck the flashing to the zip and to the wall. So you can't take, just slip it out. Just by taking a piece of metal flashing and it could be comp, you know, compatible. And it's just a, a piece that you're going to put down over the wall. And now you can take your step flashing, you can tuck it up underneath and then take it out and then put it up and take it out. And then if you want to tape across this, now I can tape across the top of the counter flashing. You know, it's something that's been done in masonry for years, but it's not something we think about with wood or fiber cement or uh, any of the other types of siding that we install. So, and, th and that, that isn't just the case for a step flashing. That could even be a cap flashing over a window. Having that counter flashing, some piece of some material, plastic or metal that we can tuck up under in the future, take out the old flashing, tuck back up nice and easy. That's Here's brilliant, Mike. Throw this, throw this out there. So um, here, I'll do a quick screen share. Sorry, I'm not gonna do a quick screen share. I'll just say it. Um, <laughs> Uh, Bill Rose's book, Water and Buildings, is a phenomenal, phenomenal resource. And then just a couple of weeks ago, Joe Stebrick uh, released his updated version of Moisture Control for Residential Buildings that I'm just starting to get into. Uh, really another phenomenal resource. I think between the two of those, if you can slog through Bill Rose's book and then laugh at Joe's book, uh, you're going to be in good shape for knowing how to handle water on buildings. I want to put the onus on our designers and architects because we have all sorts of beautiful scuppers. There's lamb's tongue scuppers, there's gargoyles puking out, all sorts of roof drainage. Why can't the noble kickout flashing get a beautiful design that we can show with pride that we're protecting the entire sidewall of our homes as we move from roof to wall? Let's make them beautiful. Let's make them features. They don't have to be an unpleasant little fold. We can make them... You know, I think we could maybe do one in the um, in a respectable way. The the bold visage of one Aaron Jones. I'm just saying, big dog, baby. What do you think? Anybody on this? The Aaron Jones silhouette kick out flashing. I'm on this. <laughs> yeah, your Six face be is going to be all over the U.S. Um, just <laughs> saying. Uh... <laughs> What's Actually, my response to Travis was going to be, remember when we were on the podcast and we had that conversation about all the cool stuff that you did and the homeowner was like, I don't get it. That's it. <laughs> You're right. I mean, I'm not saying exterior details like that couldn't be built in and we couldn't make them beautiful and let's stop making a million dormers and jogs and whatever that make complicated flashing details uh, and let's celebrate the beautiful, simple things uh, from the way we used to build uh, beautiful, simple, purposeful things. Um, I can Sorry, get behind that. Caps. And I know we're running low on time, but let me just uh, take a quick look at this. Is this, um, Mike, is this what you were talking about? <laughs> almost, almost yeah. that. So you, you basically, you're, just, you're not making, you're not using a special shaped flashing that sticks out. You're just using, you're just tucking the finishes behind the step flashing so that. Uh... Well, well, yeah, but, well, actually I, I, I was uh, uh, joking. There, there would be a whole other piece of flat, flat sheet metal that, basically goes behind that drip edge, goes behind that step flashing, goes behind the gutter, and okay. goes on, goes on. In this case, it would probably go on the face of the clapboard at the elevation of the gutter, but it actually might even go on the clapboard below and you'd actually slice, you know, continue your, your roof angle down across the uh, clapboard that's at the gutter. Um, it, it, it's, it, it looks much cleaner and simpler than I can explain. Um, Mike, Mike, I think explained it about as well. It probably looks a lot better than this. I mean, yes. this is how I was taught to do uh, what what is now kickout flashings. But the problem is, you know, it makes a mess underneath it, and and then someone yeah. comes up and smushes caulk on it, and it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, but no, so this, that's you have a much better idea. idea. That makes a lot more sense. Okay. Well, sorry. it's it's it's. I think what you're you're showing is way better than just having the 
uh, step flashing end on top of the house wrap and then yeah. just ignoring it because yeah. it's just it's guaranteed to, to cause problems. Like I've made kickouts where it's just the little kickout. It's like an inch, inch and a quarter or something like that. They don't need to be these huge four, five, six inch things like the off the shelf ones are. You know, as much as I like those from a, a, a protection aspect, they're ugly as sin. So. Yeah, yeah, but so is rot. So it's, you know, what do you... <laughs> and even when you get one of those commercially available ones, there's nothing to say that you can't just trim it off so that it does, like you say, Ben, just stick out a half inch or so. I That's take nice those thing ones right there, Mike, and I round the corner off to give them kind of an arch and make them look a little bit more graceful. Yeah. I put a BS and beer show sticker on them so that you can see it from the ground on the big billboard. That's how we get the word out. And maybe a big dog sticker next to it would be good with that too. I don't know. What do you guys think is? Well, I'll put another thought out there. Sorry, Travis, but who cares what a kickout flashing looks like? I'll tell you right now, today I was on a job site and the downspout, the way it had to be origamied in, I don't like the looks of it. I'm sure the downspout guy doesn't like the looks of it. I guarantee you no homeowner is ever going to look at those series of joints and care. But there's going to be pretty much no maintenance for them. It's going to work. It's going to keep the building safe. And to me, that is kind of the overriding thing. Build in such a way as to minimize maintenance. But pay attention to those spots. If, you, if you've got a valley running to an inside corner, and you look around and you've got maple trees around you, meet with the homeowner before you sell it. Or if you're an architect, explain some of those things. This is your problem spot. Make sure you maintain this because if this gets plugged, this is what's going to happen over time. You know, I think maintenance is the one thing we haven't addressed here, but ultimately we're going to walk away from these buildings and the more maintenance free, we can make it great, but no house is maintenance free. So explaining some of those problem areas is probably going to spotlight something to the homeowner. And I think that happens to all of us. We tend to see just masses of objects unless we're an expert on it. Then when we're an expert, we can micro on each one of these little details. And so just helping with that with a homeowner, we put roof anchors on our buildings so that if maintenance needs to be done, they can do it safely. Just those little simple things is probably going to go a long ways to maintaining the building. I think you're totally right. And I think Aaron, uh, you know, big dog stickers would be great, but I think if you just made a whole bunch of flash me stickers that could get pasted all over in the critical areas, you should be like, GC walks around and it's just like, spot here this is where the kick out flashing is going to go flash me there's a sticker right the roof with the wall connected flash me like just a reminder you know like a simple thing like oh yeah hey we got to make sure we get this detail right this is the, we need flashing here we'll be i mean it would be funny <laughs> you can put them in your plants you can just stick it right on the page. I, I can I was just, i'm just gonna have like an arrow that goes out that just says flash me follow this qr code this is how you do it <laughs> hey can i ask you a question emily yeah do you in your uh, architectural drawings do you use colors uh, for example if you were doing flashing details would you have blue as an example where all of your flexible flashing or rigid flashing goes so it's very very clear and in each one of your plan views Yes, we do use color. We get a lot of pushback because they don't always print them in color. And I'm like, I will print you a set of color drawings. This will tell you where our air barrier is, where our uh, WRB is, where our flashing details are, how they overlap, where the, you know, because especially if you're only doing a 2D drawing, if you're not doing a 3D explosion of how everything works or goes together, it can get really caught up in the lines. And um, I was taught uh, to draft with hand drawing and you had to know what every line was when you were hand drawing. 
in CAD, you can zoom into the weeds and then you explode that out and it gets blurry and messy and it's not always clear to the people in the field. And so we definitely have some sheets that are printed in color. You don't have to print every set. I don't care if my logo is printed in color on the sheets that don't need to be in color. But on two or three sheets, there's definitely color sheets and I'm willing to print them from my office in color that says, hey, these are kind of important things that are gonna tell you more in a two-dimensional drawing. So yes, we do use color um, because I think sometimes color is the easiest way to convey a message in a two-dimensional drawing. All right, I just thoughts? messaged all of our hosts and panelists to say, it's time to shut the show down. But we usually go around the horn for final thoughts. It looked like Ben was about to say something super important, but now he's drinking. Again, Ben. Chug, <laughs> chug. <laughs> if anybody has anything that's uh, jumping off the page, get him to share before we we shut this thing down i think it's been a great conversation i really appreciate aaron's efforts to bring uh flashing to the fore and uh certainly appreciate all of our experts for joining us tonight mike doug brian all amazing very excited to have mike mains on as well and it was fun to be back in the chat tonight so thanks to all of you anyone with final thoughts please share all right i've got one i i i really appreciate what aaron did to kind of put this out there because i really think the way that we're going to move as an industry all of us putting it out there to share this knowledge so that other people can glean from it and better their game i'll close out mine uh one of my favorite quotes is attributed to einstein keep everything as simple as possible and no simpler i love it because we want to keep everything as simple as we possibly can but there is that tipping point where it's too simple some things require a certain level of complexity but if we can just build, I mean, we're putting what, tens of thousands of pieces into a home and it's gonna be handled by a number of people. The simpler we can make each thing, the better. It, what I saw at the beginning of the chat was a lot about material specifications. Try to keep it as simple as possible, reuse things if you possibly can, and uh, you'll, you'll get economies of scale even that way and inefficiencies of labor. I was just going to say, I think, uh, I think Mike Gurton is uh, getting it done for the industry um, and everyone else. Um, you know, people who take the time to post how to do stuff uh, and go, you know, make videos and speak at conferences and write articles. Uh, I actually have, I think things have gotten way, way better than a decade ago, at least in my area. Um, of course, it couldn't have gone downhill from where, where we were. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty optimistic. I think, you know, I just stick with principle-based education and helping build capability in the people you work with, and then they'll be able to solve the weird ones. Uh, that's, that always seems like the key to me. You can make a lot of things that work until you hit that one. And then the people have to do the job. Have a good night, everybody. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you for joining us.